Good morning. Merry Christmas. Good to see you guys. You're a little lethargic this morning. <laughs> Do you have your Christmas shopping done? Is it all done? Is it still on a ship waiting to be docked and unloaded somewhere? <laughs> Come again. Hey, is that Daryl Mitchell? My name's Kevin, uh, the pastor here, uh, one of the pastors, the elders. Love, love, love. Get a chance to be here with you. Last week, it was me. Uh, and the band, and uh, we had, did have one person, one guy showed up, he sat right about there, and uh, I tried to look at him as often as I could <laughs> while he was awake, and, uh, <laughs> but uh, we're glad to be back in person, appreciate you guys uh, being flexible with us, and uh, uh, you know that we, we, we took a pause last week, we had uh, introduced uh, some elevated protocol because of some uh, things that had uh, been going on with uh, COVID uh, infections here at the church, and then had a situation where we had to do some quarantining, and so just thought it was wise to pause, go online last week, uh, and I'm happy to report for those that are here at the church um, that uh, had been infected uh, are doing well. We had a few hospitalizations, but uh, those are behind us now. Everybody's on the road to recovery, although we do have one family that has lost a loved one this week to COVID, doesn't attend the church here, the family does, uh, so be praying for them. Uh, this is a, it's a tough season we're in right now. Uh, between uh, all that's gone on in this disruption and uh, certainly the fatigue of now dealing with this for we're you know coming up on two years uh, and so we want to be diligent uh, and as Daryl said there just a reminder that a good way for us to do that is to stay close to you by electronic communication so thank you for helping us do that. Um, uh, we did start our Christmas series last week um, and uh, in, in many ways this is a traditional Advent series that we're doing as we're heading up to Christmas Eve. Uh, we're, we're going to talk, you know, in, in the Advents, if you do the Advent candles with your family, uh, there's a discussion of hope uh, and peace uh, and joy and love. And so each week we'll be looking uh, about, uh, at and about those issues and how the Christmas story reflects those four key parts of our faith and the Advent being really just an expectation of an arrival uh, uh, an important person is coming, and so there is an advent, there's a, a, a waiting, and so that's why we call this series Arrival, because it's about, in part, that first advent, the, the messianic promise, the, the one who was waited for, uh, that most missed, honestly, at the time, but we now look back and realize just what Pastor Darrell had prayed, everything changed as a result of it, everything is different uh, because of it. Uh, and then we, we look at those things, and last week we looked at the hope and the hope we have in that first Advent, but also that our Advent season now, our expectation, the arrival that we're waiting for now, is not on the Bethlehem arrival. That's an important mark. That's a, a significant event in the history of Christianity that began something new. But our Advent is about the return of Christ, the consummation. That we live in a time in between, that Christ was born in Bethlehem, that he lived for 33 years, he took on the flesh that you and I share, that he experienced the things we experienced, he did it perfectly, he died voluntarily and he supernaturally was resurrected on what we celebrate on Easter Sunday. And because of that, you and I can enjoy and have access to new life. And so that begins our restoration but the completeness of the kingdom, because we know we live in a time in between, isn't fully realized until you, if you watched last week, you, you, you saw me, I went to Revelation 21, to the, almost the, the chapter before the very last chapter of the end of the Bible, uh, where the prophet John talks about this new Jerusalem. After the final arrival, where, where John talks about no more death, no more tears, no more mourning, no more pain. That promise gives us hope. That promise is what we put our eternal hope in, and so we have good reason to be hopeful, but we also talked about the hope we have in the now, so I encourage you to go back and listen to that if you missed last week's talk on hope. But today we talk about the second part of Advent, the second part that is affected by the arrival, and that is the issue of peace. What, what does peace look like? How do I find the peace? What is the peace that's promise to me because honestly, you know, this is one of those topics, I, I say this often here, um, I've preached for, I don't know, seven or eight years now, and early on I felt the pressure to only talk about topics 
that I felt like I was good at <laughs> or that I felt like I had some victory uh, over uh, because I, I wanted to be real. I, I want to sit and give you my understanding of what Scripture says about an area that is a personal struggle of mine, right? That would almost seem like that would be hypocritical. I, I try to balance that by saying there are areas of my life that I struggle, but I still want to teach to it because I want to teach the whole counsel of God. And just because I'm struggling with it doesn't mean you ought not to know about it, right? Peace is one of those areas. I, I struggle with peace. It, it, it does not come naturally. But it, and it's partly hereditary. I'll blame it on my parents. Right? <laughs> we, we, we patents, we worry like it's our job. I mean, it's, it's like we believe that our, our, our mansion is going to be built on a foundation of all the worry we've collected up until that point. And it's out of care. It's out of concern. It's out of a realistic view of who we are and what the world is. But we worry. I worry. It's a struggle. I know Jesus told me not to. But be, despite that, it's still a struggle of mine. And so when we talk about this topic of peace, I just have to start by saying, I, I preach to myself again all week. I've preached on peace several times, and every time I preach on it, I preach to me first. So be comforted in knowing this is the second run at this, okay? And I've done what I could to try to take into account the growth that I've had. And the reality is, is that regardless of what your personality or your tendencies are, or how, how much you would lend towards that issue of not being a peaceful person, but we live in a time that's not peaceful. And, and, and I think, you know, if you look out through the whole of human history, if you talk about world peace or external peace, there has rarely, if ever, been a time that throughout the whole universe there was not conflict. It was not violence. It was not war. So, so war and violence has always been part of the human story. But the reality is, is that even though today we happen to, in our country, we don't happen to be in declared war in any active, that doesn't mean people aren't at risk. I'm just saying we don't have a declared war going on right now, that there's still not much peace in America today. And it's because the, the peace that we're looking for isn't just defined on what's outside of us. But, but I would say that, you know, based on my understanding of American history, that there's been few times that has been as divisive and unpeaceful internally as, what right, as where we're at right now. Maybe you look back at the 60s, or maybe even before that, you go back to even the Civil War and be hard-pressed to find a time where we are so divided, we, we are so full of vitriol and discontent and division. And so if you are by nature, a more optimistic person, a more peaceful person, a more positive person, and you happen to have a news channel, you're going to struggle with peace too. That's, that's the time we live in. We live in a broken world, again, because we've not found that new Jerusalem. That second arrival has yet to come. And so, if you're like me or if you're not like me, either way, I think this is a topic that needs to be talked about. And I think that Christmas is a, a natural and a good place for us to be talking about it because of what started in Bethlehem and because of the name of who Jesus is, what the angel will go on to tell us. So th this is having a, a toll, right? That I, I looked up the, the, the data on it that uh, I think there's 360, 380 million Americans somewhere there. I've not checked the latest tabulation, but 40 million Americans have some type of diagnosed, verifiable anxiety disorder. 40 million. That was 10% of our population. And, and, and then you, you lessen that window up a little bit to the time we've been through just in the past 20 or 21 months since COVID has began. A, a recent research project revealed that 40% of Americans, fourfold what that original number was, are experiencing some type of symptoms of anxiety disorder. And so even if it wasn't a struggle with you before we are in the pandemic that we're in right now, it's certainly there. And again, I believe all of that kind of sets the stage for the reality is that this is an issue that I think we all ought to keep on the forefront because peace isn't always something that just automatically happens. Now, so sometimes peace is a, is a place for us. It's that place we go. It's those pictures we place on Instagram, right? Where we, 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 we show the beach water. It's serene. It's beautiful. And it is peaceful, right? And, and, and those, those aren't bad places for us to go and to be. But the reality is, is what the peace that I want to talk about today is a peace that follows us everywhere. That it's not dependent on where we are or what we're going through or what we're confronting. But it is an internal peace that is promised to us and, and as always. 
and I get my direction from this as it relates to that first arrival from what I talked about last week. If you remember last week, I, I talked about this, this time of the prophets, both the major and the minor prophets, the 16 prophets that, that in the time of Israel when there was tremendous conflict, right? The, this was after the Davidic and, the, and, and Solomon had built the temple. They'd gone into a place of division where there was a, a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom that was both Israel and Judah and a series of not-so-great kings. Every now and then a good one would come along, but for the most part, it was a very difficult time in the history of Israel. And it was a lot of division, and they were always under threat from their neighbors, whether it's the Egyptians or the Assyrians uh, or the Babylonians or, or, or the Persians. There just was always conflict. And remember, this was the promised people. These were the people of the covenant, both the a Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant and the Davidic covenant, that, they, that God had chosen them. He called them out. He'd given them a promised land. And for much of that time, they weren't experiencing that promise, and it was at the hands of their enemies. And so peace was not something they'd experienced a lot, certainly in the time of these prophets. And so we see these prophets come and talk about a future. And you remember, prophets weren't just about foretelling, right? This wasn't just about future telling, but about, for, about forth telling. Like, this is the situation we're in right now. And many of them would say, we're in this situation because we did this. This is what God's going to do because of the promise he gave us. And that there were several of those prophets. I mentioned one last week, Jeremiah. Today we're going to see from Isaiah. We also see from Zechariah. And even uh, last week, uh, again, I talked about Jeremiah. That this idea that there was, a, there was a solution coming. There was a Messiah coming. And that Isaiah talks about him as he talks about a change in this relationship between God and Israel, despite the lack of peace. And in Isaiah 9, verse 5, he says this, amidst all of the conflict that they were experiencing at the time, he said, every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be the fuel for fire. For to us, a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So if you were, a, if you were a, a Jewish listener or someone reading this prophecy, whether in Isaiah's time or later, this was good news. That for wherever you found yourself in the history of, of the Hebrew people, that whatever oppressor was oppressing you at that time, or even if you existed in the middle of the exile, there was a promise of a future peace. And it was going to come in the form of a king. What we learned from Jeremiah, it would come from the line of David. And there was this promise, and there were dozens of prophecies that were fulfilled in the Bethlehem birth. And so this was all good news. And the problem was, was the assumption was that the birth of Jesus was going to solve it all. And of course, the filter for those who were reading it from the prophet Isaiah was specifically for the nation of Israel. We now know, looking back, that Isaiah's prophecy was in part in Bethlehem, but it is incomplete until we see what happens in Revelation 21. And so Isaiah's prophecy to the Israelites is a prophecy to you and I today. And it is because that we can call Jesus the Prince of Peace. And so as we consider, so we, could, we could spend weeks uh, on the names of God and the, and the names of, of Jesus, what the scriptures call him, what Gideon had built, the, he, he built the, 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 the altar for what he called the Jehovah Shalom, God of peace, God who is our peace. And so we see that this role of God as the peace person, as the peace bringer is throughout scripture, but something was different in this Bethlehem birth. Something changed for us. And we see this in this arrival as the Prince of Peace grows up and, and in Jesus and his teaching as he talks about the things of peace. And he's preparing them that, you know, my birth was not the end of the conflict that we're concerned about. And in fact, we see from the things that Jesus did and said, he created conflict. <laughs> there, there, he, we, we call him the Prince of Peace, but he made a lot of enemies. 
In, in fact, the, 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 the passage I'm about to share with you was just before he was killed by those enemies because of the things he said about himself that we now know is true, but they saw as a threat to themselves. And so in that place, Jesus prepared his disciples, and I think he's speaking to us today and the time and place we're in today, and saying, when I'm talking about the peace that I'm bringing you in this time, I want to, I want to measure, I want to level set your expectation. And he says this in John 16, verse 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Remember, this is John 16, where just in the next few chapters, he goes on to be brutally beaten and tortured and killed. So, so he knew something about trouble. He, he knew about the trouble that the disciples would go on to face. He knew about the world that even as he left it and ascended to heaven, that was not going to be complete in its fullness. And so he was preparing his disciples. And it's one of the things that we consider to be so important here at the Village Church as we proclaim the good news of Jesus and we talk about the eternal benefit and the, the benefit of what happens now. Well, he wants you to be prepared that all of your problems will not go away when you meet Jesus and you'll likely pick up some new ones. <laughs> but take heart because he's overcome the world. And I think as we consider this idea of peace, we've, we've got to begin to set aside our, our human expectations for what peace is and how I get to peace. Because the reality is, because I've been to a lot of Celebrate Recovery talks and I've talked to a lot of Celebrate Recovery leaders, that if my personal peace is based on my ability to, to, to control the external conflict around me, I will never find peace. I will never find peace if the expectation is I control what is not peaceful around me. And so part of me finding this peace in the time now is expecting and knowing that in this world there will be trouble. And that the reality is that while I pray for world peace and I have this hope and expectation that no conflict would ever exist, that's not promised to us either. And so as I begin to narrow in my expectations about what it means for me to find that internal peace, knowing that in many ways external peace isn't something that I'm able to give to, then my focus moves to my internal peace. And so it comes about me at some level and hopefully what is really a healthy way. So what we see in the arrival of Jesus, the Prince of Peace, is that he's, he's offering a different kind of a peace. He, he's changing the subject. He's, he's changing the rules. He's getting us to, to not think about the life and the flesh that we're so, we're so given to, but to think about the life and the spirit that he's calling us to, that his apostle Paul would go on to talk about, and then reshape the idea of what it meant for us to have peace. And in that internal peace, I find that there are really kind of three areas for me that, that really become peace blockers. Because there are ways to go and find peace, I guess, in some ways. But the reality is, if I don't have peace, it's because something's going on. Something's happening in my life. Something is blocking the peace, whether it's from my own doing or from outside of me. And so as I'm heading towards this internal peace, this more eternal peace, I, I got to be mindful of how those things are going. And so for me, and this will be in your bulletin, I, I find that there are really three areas. There are three areas that I've got to be free from when I think about finding peace. The first area is one that I've already shared with you, is that for me to be free from the difficulty of peace, I've got to be free from worry. I've got to be free from worry. And we know what Jesus said in Matthew 6. He says, he says, don't worry. How many of you can add a day to your life by worrying? Right? Despite that, we try to add days to our life, and in fact... I think it's probably removed a few. But meanwhile, in my life, and I'm sure in yours, there's still sickness. There's still broken relationships. There's still financial lack. There's still fear. So despite Jesus saying to me, don't fear, or I'm sorry, don't worry, there's all these things that I can be fearful of that cause me to worry. And so we go to the Apostle Paul, who gives us some insight about what do we do with worry? Because I don't think in and of itself it's a sin to have the thought of worry, right? I think the problem can be is what do we do with that worry? 
And in Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, the church in Philippi uh, was, was, was suffering persecution, was in trouble. Paul was sending them a letter to encourage them, to share with him and kind of update what's going on in his life at that time and thank them for a gift that sent him in prison. But then as he closed out Philippians in, the, in chapter 4, he, he gives them some advice on how to persevere in this difficult time that are in. And around verse 6, he says this about worry. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Now, I can do something with that. Because to just tell me don't worry doesn't give me anything to do with the thing that comes to me naturally. I've got to have an action to offset that action. And he goes on to talk about his personal experience. He says, tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you'll experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So, so I see in, in Paul's instructions there, for those of us who have a struggle with worry, is that the first thing we've got to do is to not worry about anything but pray about everything. But then also, again, borrowing from my teachings that I've heard in Celebrate Recovery, is that if we bring gratitude to worry, gr- gratitude's a worry killer. That many times the things that I worry about are re- really hyper-focusing on my lack, on the things that I don't have or that I don't control. And the offset of that, the antidote of that worry, is a grateful heart and saying, God, thank you for everything you've done for me. That while my mind wants to consume itself for all that I don't have or all that I'm struggling with, I want to spend that same time, same time praying and thanking God for all that he's done and remembering who he is in my life. And at that point, I find, and I've experienced this, that my worries begin to diminish and I find a deeper internal peace. The other thing that I struggle with that gets in the way of my peace is discontent. Discontent. And again, I'll continue to share my struggles this morning. I'm never satisfied. It's just, it, it just and I, maybe I'm not alone in the room with that. Nobody's nodding their head at me. But I'm never satisfied. I, I find it very difficult to get to a place where I'm just content. That, that even when things are good, I think, well, they could be better, right? If I just work a little harder, I, I do this. And when things are struggling, I, I, I internalize it and say, if I would change and behave or, or, I, or I deal with the shame of falling backwards on a struggle that I'd been having before, but, but I'm never satisfied. I'm always thinking about how to be better. And so in some ways that makes me a reformer. That could be a good thing, right? But if I never find contentment, I never find peace. If I'm never satisfied, I'm always looking for that next thing to find satisfaction And there again, I'm trying to find an external peace when God is offering me a more internal peace. Now, I'm not alone in that. Again, I'll take a jab at our culture here because that's a very difficult thing. We have an entire economic system built on us never being satisfied. That if we ever really had everything we need, what commercials would we watch, right? Everything that's speaking to us in media is reminding us about how somebody else has a better life that I need to go and find. Somebody else's children are better behaved than having cuter grandchildren. They're talking about me. (laughs) Just kidding. Somebody else has more money. Somebody has less problems. And all of this is satisfied in this product, this pill, this solution we have for you. Right? And so this, this system is built on our discontent. It's built on our dissatisfaction. And so if we just go with the flow, we are going to be unpeaceful people. We're going to be discontented. Again, the Apostle Paul, just a few verses later in that same letter to the Philippians, he talks about this issue of contentment. He says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. What what Paul is saying, I think, reflects the reality of what I see in the relationships around me. It certainly reflected my life. That that for me to find contentment, I've got to get beyond where the, 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 the individual circumstances that I'm in are driving the level of peace that I'm finding internally. Because I found the same thing. I know families that really struggle in poverty. People that really have lack, but have a lot of peace. I've met very wealthy men and women that have all kinds of resources, 
but are never peaceful. And so it's not about the amount or what we can accumulate, but it's about us finding that contentment in either want or in need. But in the end, I've, I've got to find a way to deal with this inability for myself to find satisfaction and discontent. The final area for me, not that there's only three, but these are the three big ones, is it's hard for me to find internal peace uh, because of the, uh, the freedom I need from division. Division. And, and for me, this is about my personal relationships. This is about the relationships around me, and sometimes, honestly, my relationship with the Lord. That, that, that as I struggle through the very predictable human experiences that we all have, that I, I deal with conflict and, and bitterness, I, I deal with unresolved hurt, and, and I deal with relationships that are frankly just out of order. And for me, depending on the, the circle that that relationship finds it's in, the closer it gets to me, the, the, the less peace I'm able to have when that relationship is in conflict. And so I have to do sometimes do the hard work of investing in those relationships and sometimes setting healthy boundaries to know that that person's inability to be in my life, what our relationship requires, cannot determine my peace. Every parent in here is nodding their head. <laughs> because that's, you know, they, they've, they've written almost no books about how to parent adult children, right? <laughs> we, we, we've gone through this as we've raised our children, we've brought them through, and we've dealt with the difficulty of rearing children. But as we get to the place where we want to maintain relationship with our children and they're able to make those decisions, that we have less control of that. And so that's just an example of the kind of relationship that will always bring difficulty in our life. And I've heard someone say before that a parent is only as happy as their saddest child. And so for us, rather than worry, we need to pray for our children. We, we need to pray for our relationships. We need to invest in those relationships to, to find order. And we find that it, m many times that the, the source of poverty is we're working alongside families to the, the work of Joshua's place isn't just about a lack of resources financially. That's a big piece of it. But it's really the chaotic or the lack of healthy relationships that are surrounding people. We, 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 we see that if they can realign and begin to reorder their relationships in a way that's reflective of what the Scripture asks for us as it relates to serving and loving and giving and even creating healthy boundaries, that their life will find an order, that they will find a deeper peace that wasn't there because the chaos was so extreme before they went into it. And not forgetting that this is Christmas... <laughs> We have, to, we have to mark this time and realize that, that Bethlehem did something very different. That, that, that we, we want to continue to, to think and, and talk about and remember Revelation 21. We are hopeful. We pray, come Lord Jesus. I, 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 I think about and I'm, I'm jealous for the idea of no more death, no more pain, no more heartache, no more crying. I want that, right? But I'm living now. But what did Bethlehem do for us now? Well, it's what I think the shepherds said to the, uh, I'm sorry, the angel said to the shepherds in Luke 2, thir verse 13, he said this, just after the angel had spoken, suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. On whom his favor rests. Well, that's an important distinction, don't you think? <laughs> because Jesus did come to bring world peace. J Jesus did come to save the world. It it's not his, his desire that any would perish, but that all would have everlasting life. But the reality is, is we have a choice in this Bethlehem story, don't we? That We, we have a decision. We have a, a free will that is activated by that first arrival that will affect the consequences of the second arrival. And I think it's what the angel was hinting at when he said to those on him his favorite rest. It doesn't mean that God has partiality. We know in the character of God he's in, incapable of partiality. But it does mean that we have a choice. That the level of peace and contentment and satisfaction and unity and relationships that exist in our life is directly correlated with what we do with Bethlehem. It's what we do with this person of Jesus, and that for me to, to find peace, I have to find peace through the salvation of what Jesus did for me. 
that whom his favor rests is those that have put their trust and their eternity in Jesus. That they didn't do what Ricky Bobby did on Talladega Nights, where he preferred the baby Jesus in the, in the manger. They play the tape forward. They see that baby Jesus become the man Jesus, the one who became a sacrifice, and the one who supernaturally raised for the sins of the world and for me. And they do something with it, because in John 3, as he's talking to the Pharisee, he's saying, if you want life eternal, you've got to be born again. That, that it's not just about a belief. It's not just thinking that Jesus was a good guy, the things that he taught were nice things, but about starting over, about being reborn, confessing with my now, mouth the sins, the, the, the gap between God and I, repenting and turning away, and believing that the work he did is finished. And then in that work, I can put my faith and all the power that's given to me. So that handles our salvation, right? But we still live in a broken world, don't we? That I know many of you have been born again, many of you have been saved, and you still struggle to find peace. Well, you're not alone in that. And then while we continue to live this world, and as we consider what it means to be people of peace, Again, I'll go to John later in the, the book of John chapter 14, when Jesus gives us the secret sauce of peace after salvation. Here's what he said. All this I've spoken while still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You see what Jesus was saying after he would go on to acknowledge that in this world we'll have trouble, but that he would overcome the world. He was about to overcome the world in his, what he had did in his death and resurrection. But he had to leave so that the counselor would come, the Holy Spirit. The, the one who would remind us, the one who would bring us to a, a convicted understanding, the one that would move through us prophetically, the one that would help us change and be more like Jesus. Because the reality is, I can't find that peace until I'm changed into his likeness. That as I become more like him, then I find that inner peace. Now, I never arrive, I'll never be perfect, but the process of sanctification, the process of me finding ways to do healthy and right things with that conflict is the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. It's what we talked about today in Bible study. We were in Galatians 5 and Paul goes into that way that only Paul can do where he compares this life in the flesh where we kind of put our desires first and what those outcomes look like, the acts of the flesh. And then he talked about the fruit of the Spirit. What are the outcomes of walking in a surrendered place with the Holy Spirit? And what is one of those fruits? Peace. That when we walk in the Spirit, when we are filled by the Spirit, when we bear the fruit of the Spirit, we have peace. Now, I don't know about you and what your situation is today, but I've not found lasting peace on a beach or a mountain trail I found enduring peace from God using difficulty many times to, to burn away the very temporal things that I hold on to. And I don't know if this is good news or bad news for you, but whatever that thing is in your life right now that you're struggling to find peace in, it's not because God's mad at you. There's a pretty good chance he's using that. There's a pretty good chance that whatever struggle that you're battling through right now Maybe at many levels, lots of things, but at least one of those levels is God revealing to you the very temporal nature of the problems we have today and how temporal those things are we hold on to. And many times I don't want to give up on those things until I'm forced to. I'm forced to take a good hard look at my relationships. I'm forced to take a good hard look at my coping mechanisms and the things that I, I, I invest in. I, I have to take a very good and hard look at, at, at where I spend my money and how I spend my time. You see, difficult has a way of bringing the refiner's fire and purifying us in that place. And, and I can't tell you the number of times over the decades that I've been serving the Lord that I find that internal peace after an extended time of suffering and difficulty. 
And what I want to pray for us about today is, firstly, if you don't know the Lord, that you would be born again. If you're not actively being filled with the Spirit, that you would surrender and be filled with the Spirit. If you're in a place of struggle right now, that you would embrace that and not question about God's goodness or whether or not he's mad at you, but say, Lord, what do you have for me? What do you have for me in this time? Because I'm looking for that peace. Let me pray for you that way this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, I first pray for anyone that is here or is listening that doesn't know you. And there's a narrow path. There's a gate that has to be walked through. There's a decision that we have to make. We can't just show up and be around it, Lord. We've got to commit. We've got to give over to it. We've got to go all in. Jesus, you called that being born again. And so I pray for those that are here or listening that have not been born again, that they would repent of their sins, recognizing the gap between you and them. They would believe the finished work of what you did on the cross, Lord, and that they would commit to following you. And Lord, for those that have made that commitment and that are today that have been born again, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come and that you would move, that you would bring us all to a place of surrender, Holy Spirit, that you would, you would make alive the word of God to where we would see and read the, the, the nation of Israel as, as reflection and, and metaphorical for our own lives. God, that as you promised, those same promises, many of them extend to us today. And so, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would awaken in us a, a new view of who you are so that, God, while we're in the struggles we're in, as we deal with the difficulty, Lord, that we know that you are good and in your goodness and in your supernatural movement, we will find peace. Jesus, because you are the promised Prince of Peace, and in you we put our trust. It's in your name we pray. Amen.